The opinions expressed on this program represent the viewpoints of individual authors or contributors and do not necessarily reflect those of Troy University. This is eConversations, a joint production of Troy Trojan Vision and the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy. Now, here's your host, Dr. Dan Sutter. Hello and welcome to eConversations. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Sutter of the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. The United States was founded on the idea of freedom despite the contradiction of slavery. Following the Civil War, the Emancipation Proclamation, and passage of the 13th Amendment, slavery was ended. But our nation failed to fully protect the rights of the emancipated, particularly after Reconstruction, with the political disfranchisement of blacks and the institution of Jim Crow segregation. Although the political system failed black Americans, our market, market economy enabled economic progress and provided the financial support for uh, ultimately the civil rights movement that ended uh, segregation. Joining me on eConversations today to discuss the 100-year uh, journey from emancipation to civil rights is Dr. Marcus Witcher. He's a co-author of a new book, Black Liberation Through the Marketplace. Marcus is an assistant professor of history at Huntington College and he earned his master's and PhD in history from the University of Alabama. He's the author of numerous scholarly articles and his uh, prior book, Getting Right with Reagan, received some excellent reviews. Welcome back to the show, Marcus. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, and for anyone who understands freedom, obviously slavery was completely in, in, incompatible with the idea of a nation founded on, on equality and, and freedom and, and uh, all men are, are created equal. Well, with, with, the, uh, uh, civil, with the Civil War, and we, and we finally ended the, uh, the blight of, of, of slavery on our uh, country. But to talk about the situation there, when emancipation occurred, we didn't necessarily, we didn't compensate the, uh, the, the freed slaves at all for their, their labor that they hadn't gotten paid for. And then if you also want to talk about it, like the, the South, Southern economy had been quite uh, affected by the Civil War. So tell us a little bit about the, the timing here of, of when uh, emancipation occurred. Yeah, so when I lecture um, at Huntington College, right, in Montgomery, I always tell the students it's a time of jubilation and it's a time of sorrow, right? It's a time of jubilation for black Americans who have gained uh, freedom. Um, and it's a time of sorrow because hundreds of thousands of Americans have lost their lives and the southern economy, as you mentioned, has been devastated. And even though black Americans have received freedom, they don't, they ha they don't necessarily have the skills necessary to um, sort of participate in the economy, what's mm -hmm. left of it. And the skills that they do have most oftentimes are agricultural in nature, which means that they oftentimes end up going and working for the very plantation owners whom they just were freed from. Um, and so in a lot of ways, Reconstruction, that time right from 1865 to roughly 1877 or so, is a time where um, there's this, all these opportunities that could potentially come true, but as you and I know, um, unfortunately, they didn't end up coming to pass. Mm -hmm. And so we can see the inconsistency between slavery and freedom, but in a market economy, people need to have certain rights uh, protected. And a big part of your story in your book is how uh, we didn't necessarily completely protect all, all the rights that, that uh, black Americans would have needed to, to uh, participate in our economy. So before we get into the yeah. details, so tell us a little bit, like what are, are these uh, rights that, that people need to have protected? Yeah, so um, Rachel Ferguson, my co-author, and I really emphasize that we're presenting a positive narrative. Um, we're presenting sort of a, you know, a story about how America can address past injustice, um, but not jettison our sort of liberal values. And one of the core components of those values, right, which are so essential to uh, sort of liberty, freedom, flourishing, are the right to life, liberty, property. Mm -hmm. um, and all those things have to be protected by the rule of law, right, the rule of law. And what we actually see is that most of those rights aren't protected at all. And indeed, laws are created across the South, really beginning in 1873, um, going all the way forward, right, which systematically uh, take rights away from black Americans, mm -hmm. whether it be freedom of movement, whether it be um, the right to contract, whether it be um, 
whether it be the right to vote, which you've mentioned already, um, whether it be just simply, you know, being protected within your own body. And we'll talk mm -hmm. about, I imagine, convict leasing, you know, here in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but there, these are just clear violations of liberal law um, that took place um, in the American South after Reconstruction. I do want to say there were attempts, right, by the Freedmen's Bureau and other organizations uh, to try and help black Americans. And it's really incredible what black Americans were able to do in terms of literacy, um, et cetera, despite the fact that there were all these barriers um, put up before them to restrict them from the market economy and to restrict their opportunities to flourish. And one that I think you mentioned in your book, was, this was prior to the Civil War, but it, uh, freed blacks were, had their ability to own land restricted. That, mm. that even if you were free, you, you couldn't necessarily own uh, land in all the states. And that would be a clear violation mm. of the kinds of freedom of contract that you need to have in, in a in, in, in a market economy. Absolutely, and then also if we think about, you know, gun control's been in the news lately, like some of the first, most, many, all of the first uh, uh, restrictions on gun ownership are also mm -hmm. uh, explicitly targeting black Americans, which once again is a violation of their liberty to try and protect not only themselves, uh, but also their property. And of course, um, in the 1870s, they have to protect their property from and themselves from uh, vigilante groups, terrorist organizations, if you will, uh, like the KKK. It, it, I think we'll come back to this a little bit long, later. But you know, if, if you have people whose rights aren't being protected, then they can always be, you can always go and steal from them. And I think mm -hmm. that that's a part of the, the, the story, unfortunately, that we have here. Well, you mentioned the fact that the South was very agrarian, and so in the aftermath of, of uh, emancipation, if you have a largely agrarian economy, which first off, also in, in bad situations, simply because of, of manpower losses and. And, and, and all the disruption from the war, oftentimes you know, Union soldiers going through uh, burning stuff and everything. The tremendous economic devastation uh, that, that we, you know, we normally can't know, think about here in, in, in the United States. But we, we did see something arise called sharecropping. And, uh, and, and some historians have pointed to sharecropping and suggest that, well, it was just uh, slavery reestablished uh, under uh, a new guise. But that's really not the, the, the case. Sharecropping was, was something very different from the plantations, although it did in, in many times uh, involve the same people working at, the, at this, you know, sometimes the same place as they did before. But it, it was very different. And, and we can see some uh, uh, facts here. So tell us a little bit about sharecropping first. Yeah, so I mean, I think that the story on sharecropping is 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 complicated, right? Mm -hmm. Historians like to say it is complicated. There are definitely examples of people who were engaged in sharecropping, and sharecropping would be where you had, we were rented out basically, or you were given a certain amount of land that you leased um, from the person who owned the land, oftentimes, as you said, your previous plantation master, and you would work the land, and you would produce a certain amount of goods, you could sell those goods, and then you had to pay back, right, the amount that you, uh, owed the plantation owner. And so mm -hmm. for some people in areas where there was drought, where there was horrible sort of situations, they might get in deep debt and be trapped on the land. So our, my historian colleagues who compare it to slavery are talking about those examples. But uh, Robert Higgs has an excellent book called Competition mm -hmm. and Coercion, in which he actually demonstrates that because black Americans, although many of their other rights were abrogated, they were still allowed to move. They were still mm -hmm. allowed freedom of movement. And the freedom of movement was essential to allow them to bid up their shares. So there might be some people who would hire you, plantation owners or farm owners, who would hire you, um, and they might pay you X wage, right? And then you could go to your current, you know, sort of employer and try to negotiate up, or you could move. And so Higgs demonstrates that the freedom of movement in sharecropping um, actually enabled uh, many black Americans to actually um, improve their economic mm -hmm. conditions. Obviously, they would have improved their economic conditions uh, even greater had those restrictions, those legal restrictions, not been in place. Um, but Higgs makes, I think, a pretty compelling argument that uh, historians need to nuance their perspective on, on sharecropping. And of course, it's during this time period that we see the greatest advancement of black literacy, because as soon as emancipation happens, black Americans, the first, the two, the two organizations or institutions that they build, right, the black church, uh, they build a church and they build a school, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes those two things are housed in the same building. Um, and the emphasis on education among black Americans is amazing. And by 1900, 1920, we have just a miraculous advance uh, in literacy, despite the fact that there aren't really, um, they're not getting equal amounts of public right. monies or anything like that. And so there is amazing, amazing advancement from 1870 to 1920, despite the fact you know, that black Americans were being um, excluded from a lot of the necessary elements that would lead to human flourishing.
And, and just to talk a little bit more about the share crop, because this is one case where you, you can go in with some knowledge of economics, because Robert Higgs is an economic historian, where you can go in with some knowledge of economics, and you can sort of actually see that, that conditions were getting better, because mm -hmm. under sharecropping, the, 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 the tenant farmer who didn't own any land and probably didn't have any resources to go out and buy land to begin with, when they were leasing the land, they had to pay back, in effect, pay their lease off with a share of whatever they, they raised. And, and you can actually, and Higgs goes in and points to this and, and shows that the percentage that the, the, the black sharecroppers um, were, were able to keep hmm. was consistently going up. And so that, that's a case yep. where from an economic standpoint, you can say, well, this, this isn't like completely, you know, this, this isn't completely exploitative because, you know, if it was, you simply wouldn't have raised that share at all. When you see that share getting bid up, it's 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 sort of undeniable economic proof that things mm -hmm. have to be getting better, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for at least um, a large number, right? A large number of black Americans. Like I said, I have no doubt that there are anecdotal examples of you mm -hmm. know people who this system did not work out well for them for right. a variety of reasons. But yeah, I think Higgs is pretty persuasive. And, and, and there's just another example you mentioned briefly because uh, th there's a public choice story uh, about this as well. Uh, we're called emig emigrant agents, uh, and that that, that uh, if if you could tell us a little bit about uh, the, these agents who are actually helping trying to help uh, help some uh, blacks move to the north because they, without you know any kind of knowledge of, of the north, any kind of connections mm -hmm. or anything, it would be extremely hard. You know. You know uh, to move hundreds of miles away to some place where you're uh, uh, unfamiliar with, but there were there were some people who were who were actually trying to do this because there was a demand for labor mm -hmm. in, in, in some north in places in the north where they were trying to in, induce some uh, uh, freed slaves to to move to migrate to the north, they, but they needed some help, right? Yeah, absolutely. And this is one of those excellent examples of voluntary associations, right? If we think about one of the major emphasis is one of the things we emphasize a great deal in black liberation in the marketplace is is the role of civil society, mm -hmm. uh, the role of inter, intermediate organizations between sort of the individual and the government. Um, and these people who would come down and try and facilitate these black Americans to move, right? Um, they are, you know, they're acting sort of out of their own self-interest to an extent. So there's an economic element there as well. But um, it's also, I think there's a moral component um, as well to try and help these people move mm -hmm. out of a situation that to be perfectly honest, like can't be anything other than stacked against them mm -hmm. um, in 1870 um, in the South. And so uh, I think it's really fascinating. My mind, as you were talking about this and reminding me of it, it was taken to the sort of, you know, not to, to, to bring up current events, but to taking to the sort of the idea that today there's going to be organizations that will bust people out of the South or out of, you know, places that have really tight abortion laws, right, and bust mm -hmm. them to the North. And so this is a perfectly legitimate means by which to get around sort of legal barriers, right? Regardless right. of what your views are on the issue. Mm -hmm. This is a way to get around legal barriers. Um, and it's another example, as you rightfully point out, of sort of the marketplace providing an answer to a problem, right? right. And providing networks and knowledge to people who don't have those networks and don't have that knowledge. In, in the public choice part of this, is this uh, I know a number of states actually put uh, laws in mm. place to restrict this. It, you know, so it's a, a, a type of economic regulation that was having a, a, a ill effect mm. uh, on blacks. Now there there was something that resembled slavery that I think, you, as you guys uh, mentioned, is and you and Rachel mentioned in the book. Uh, deserves to be criticized, and that's the, the system of, of convict leasing. Tell us a little bit about uh, that, that system as it emerged. Yeah, there's a wonderful, wonderful book um, called Slavery by Another Name, which is absolutely wonderful in detailing um, the real atrocities that took place in this convict leasing system. And I teach this every semester. I've been teaching it for I guess eight or ten years, and students are always appalled when they learn that um, we had a system of forced labor in the United mm -hmm. States. And so, what happens in the South uh, during Reconstruction, around the 1870s, 1880s, is that we see the advent of what we call the Pig Laws, um, a series of laws which uh, make things that used to be misdemeanors felonies and raise the fees for things that, um, you know, like stealing a fence post, those five cents fence post gets you hit with like a massive fine that you then have to work off. Or, um, or for instance, um, you know, vagrancy laws, which emerged across the South, where if you were just, if you were a black man, tended to be black men, but sometimes it was white men as well. Uh, but 
overwhelmingly, we have the records, right? We have the roles. We know it was overwhelmingly black, uh, black men who were arrested mm -hmm. on vagrancy charges. And if you were stopped by a sheriff uh, or a deputy or someone and they ask you to prove your employment, if you couldn't pull out something like a really large amount of money at the time, something like $10, or if you didn't mm -hmm. have some sort of proof that you belonged to the community or that you were employed, you could be arrested for vagrancy and charged with a fine. And then once you were in jail, then what the uh, jails would do, because they couldn't house all these people that right. they were arresting, so what they would do is they actually would lease the convicts to corporations or to uh, the mine. So uh, the Comers had a, a mine in Birmingham or in the Birmingham area um, where uh, black Americans were, black, black Alabamians were arrested and then they would be leased out um, in the mines. And the conditions in the mines are actually, we argue, and I think Slavery by Another Name, the book argues, maybe even worse than slavery. Um, and the reason why is that there's another book called If One Dies, Get Another. And that was really the attitude of the people who were renting the convicts because they mm -hmm. had no financial skin in the game, right? right. Um, if this convict dies, then you can simply go back and you can you know, get another individual mm -hmm. to come and, and work. And you can work them until they pass away. Um, right. And uh, you know, it, it was really, really atrocious. We're talking standing water. We're talking not getting fed. They don't get proper medicine. They don't have uh, warmth of blankets. Uh, to read the letters from these men who have been arrested and are just withering away in uh, places like the Colmar Mines is just really, really amazing, right, that mm -hmm. it happened here. Um, sometimes I think like it's very similar on a smaller scale, but very similar to some of the things that happened when the gulags uh, mm -hmm. in places in, in like the Soviet Union. And so it's a real, real sort of mark right upon America's past right. that we had this system of convict leasing but it's really important to emphasize that convict leasing was only possible because the government made it possible right, right. it was literally the government are, you know now of course racists wanted these laws put into effect but then they used the power of the state to get those laws to put into mm -hmm. effect to then arrest black Americans and then to you know basically coordinate and, with corporations and most importantly to provide rest on really trumped up charges mm -hmm. uh, so it's not you know I mean whether whether true felons who, who've, who've committed something should be working while they're uh, in, in prison is a different question. But these were trumped up charges, yeah. and, and largely uh, that's why I, I think it's not unreasonable to call it slavery by another name. Yeah, it's definitely not just law, right? These, right. these aren't yeah. just laws. Yeah. So you, you already talked about the explosion of, of education. Uh, an important uh, figure in, in your story is Booker T. Washington, who, who uh, contributed, uh, as you've mentioned, on the education front, but also from the standpoint of, of entrepreneurship and, and, and encouraging uh, black Americans to build up businesses. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, his, his role, because he's obviously an important figure here in Alabama. Yeah, Booker T. Washington is asked as a young man to come down to the South, right, to come and be the president of this institution, this, this college, uh, Tuskegee, right? Um, and he comes down, and the story is really incredible. I mean, everything from they literally had to make the, their own bricks. There was no mm -hmm. one in the area who made uh, the bricks necessary to build the buildings. And so you have the faculty out there. You can imagine this today, right? Uh, all the faculty at Troy out there with the students, you know, mixing straw in and trying to find the right um, sort of balance, right, for the bricks so that they would be sustainable. And, and on their, I think it was their third attempt, they succeed at Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they build their college literally from the ground up. Um, and not only that, but they begin producing the bricks and selling them to their white neighbors in the community. Mm -hmm. So they begin providing right um, a service to the rest of the community. And so he builds Tuskegee quite literally from the ground up. And what Tuskegee emphasizes mainly is sort of vocational skills, but he's also educating teachers right. um, and mainly teachers to go out and to establish their own one, you know, one room uh, schoolhouse in rural Alabama and to teach mainly black children, uh, mm -hmm. to teach exclusively black children, right, how, literacy, uh, manners, uh, other, you know, sort of the gospel, other things like that and, and, and other vocational skills would be essential for them to um, exist within sort of, you know, the, the current economy that they existed within. And so Booker T. Washington trades thousands uh, and the faculty there trained thousands of of black educators who go out into Alabama 
and produce all these little schools. And so it's really hard to measure, right, how, mm. how big of an effect Booker T. Washington had. And it has to be said that Washington's oftentimes criticized as a civil rights leader because he becomes the leader of the race uh, from sort of, that's what they called at the time, the leader of the race, right? Uh, Douglas, uh, Frederick Douglass passes away and he hands it off to Booker T. Washington. And Washington is criticized by many Northern black activists um, for not doing more on political rights. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is, is that Booker T. Washington focused, yes, on education and vocational training, but he's actually working behind the scenes to try and bring about political rights as well. It's just he couldn't do it explicitly. He couldn't do it in public because mm -hmm. if he did, there would be even more threats on Tuskegee than there already were from the white community that was quite hostile uh, to not only Booker T. Washington, but to any sort of black uplift. Mm -hmm. And, and they can say it, at about this time, uh, states across the South uh, started engaging in what's called disfranchisement, taking away the political rights of, of, of black Americans. And uh, then there was also sort of extended to, into uh, segregate laws enforcing segregation. Tell us a little bit about this time. And, and, can, and then we'll get, come back to the, uh, the point about segregation, uh, law, why, why they had to pass laws to, to enforce segregation. Yeah. So. Um, I like to tell my students, you know, 1890 to 1930 or so is probably the most racist time in American history. We have the advent of scientific racism, which is the, the sort of pseudoscientific techniques to try and say that some people are superior than, to others based upon the shape of their skulls and all types of other things. And so Booker T. Washington it exists in the midst of this time where um, it's being justified based on science that these individuals shouldn't be partaking in political elections because they're not capable of self-governance. Mm -hmm. And so Washington tries to demonstrate through his own person, right, by writing, writing his memoirs, by writing his autobiography, that, no, look at me, right? Like, black people are capable mm -hmm. of achieving these same things. They just need ed education. They just need opportunity. Um, and so, yeah, throughout this time, we have a, a slew of new constitutions that explicitly uh, across the South try to exclude black Americans. We have, of course, um, you know, the segregation of uh, of sort of streetcars and the segregation of, you know, train cars, trolley mm -hmm. cars, et cetera, uh, which ingrains into law, um, it ingrains into law through uh, Plessy, right, that um, that uh, separate but equal is, is acceptable, it's, it's right? Constitutional. It, it, it's constitutional. It's constitutional. Right, mm -hmm. it's constitutional, not acceptable, but constitutional. Right. Um, and so after that, we see that really, you know, spread mm -hmm. throughout um, throughout all elements of the economy. And most of my students, when they think back on, on Jim Crow, they think that it's just well, people drank from different water fountains. No, it went well beyond that, right? It went well, well, well beyond just simply uh, water fountains. And and, there, and it also it also is important to mention that things were never equal. Right. You know, it's yeah, separate, it's but separate equal. equal. Really, it just ended up being separate and, and very, very, very unequal. Yes. Um, and so even by the, their own standards, um, these things fail on the face of it. But yeah, those restrictions, you know, begin um, and really expand and, and exist all the way up until the 1960s. And, and the, the segregation, some of it spilled over into economic areas, restricting uh, blacks from part, you know, whole, uh, being in certain professions, mm. uh, enforcing uh, types of discrimination uh, and segregation on businesses. And that's a little bit of an interesting part of the story because it, it was a very racist time, but yet also to get the uh, segregation enforced on businesses, they had to pass laws. And there, there's a little bit of a... a a tale there. There's a, a little bit more. If you poke at that a little bit, there, there's a little bit uh, telling us some stuff about uh, some forces in the market to, with regard to discrimination. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, historians and economists have pointed to the fact that some of the businesses, right, didn't want to segregate. And this makes sense if you've read uh, sort of Gary Becker. We were talking about him a little bit before we came mm -hmm. on air. Um, you know, there's a, a, a slew of firms, a small percentage of firms, who don't want to discriminate against black Americans because it's going to hurt their bottom line. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a result, we see this in the case of the trolley cars. Um, we see some who don't want, don't want to, to segregate. Um, but ultimately, right, you have sort of this push, this overwhelming push um, to get government involved and to force businesses to actually exclude. Now, it has to be said that many white consumers wanted businesses right. to exclude um, as well. So there were market forces that were sort of, you know, sort of pressing on uh, politicians. But the fact of the matter, it, you know, remains that without the coercive power of the state, 
it'd be really interesting to see what would have happened um, mm -hmm. across the South. Would you know if there's 10% or 15% of businesses who are willing to employ black uh, black you know Southerners like uh, at a at a pretty good wage rate? Like how does that affect you know how right. does that affect the market? Uh, how does it affect the market if you have certain you know establishments that are willing to buck sort of social norms um, and you know etc. So yeah. I think it is a more complicated story than it's often presented. Um, and it's just unfortunate uh, that market forces weren't really allowed to work yeah. uh, during that time period. The atrocities often spilled over, and as you talk about in several cases, there was a clear economic angle to some of the atrocities. And maybe one of the, the worst atrocities during this time was the, the Tulsa race massacre. And that was clearly driven to some extent by envy because of, uh, in, in uh, following Booker T. Washington's idea, there were a number of successful black businesses that were uh, build, building up, and, and particularly in, in a neighborhood in Tulsa that led to you know, jealousy and then you know, basically just a, a, a terrible, horrible atrocity, in, in part motivated by jealousy. So tell us a little bit about this. If you yeah, I mean, the Tulsa massacre is really caused by white envy. I mean, black Americans in Greenwood, which is the black part of town, um, it was called Black Wall Street because mm. uh, these these Americans had done exactly what they'd been told to do uh, by Booker, P Booker T. Washington and others. They put down their bucket, so to speak. They learned skills, and they got really good at mm -hmm. their skills, right? Uh, the black mechanic in Greenwood is the best mechanic in Tulsa. People, White people bring their cars over uh, to have the black mechanic work on them because He's the best mechanic, yeah. right? Um, and so there's a level of, pros uh, of, of prosperity in Greenwood that is, you know, there's other places that had it captured before Memphis, uh, before there was a similar type incident in Memphis. Mm -hmm. So it existed elsewhere, but Greenwood is maybe the greatest manifestation of it. It's also extraordinarily, uh, an extraordinarily sad story, and it's also a cautionary tale to people who think that markets are enough, mm -hmm. right? Because markets are not enough without the just rule of law, without right. the, the government protecting individual liberty, property, um, et cetera. You know, markets can uplift you. You can uplift yourself, as they did in Greenwood. But ultimately what happened there, of course, is that we had an altercation uh, where a young black man sort of fell into uh, a, a white woman in an elevator. We're not sure exactly what happened. She accuses him of trying to like sexually assault her. He runs because he's scared, as I imagine most of us would. He's eventually arrested, and then white mobs and black mobs gather outside of the courthouse, the white mob wanting to lynch him. Um, and of course, black Americans showed up with their guns, which they could legally own, uh, and protected him. And the white mob showed up with guns. There were some shots fired. The two crowds dispersed. And the next morning, the white mob descended upon Greenwood and burned Greenwood to the ground. Um, and Tulsa's, you know, Tulsa's a great example of the fact that this is this great atrocity. But as we talk about in the book, there are ways that we today mm -hmm. can address those past atrocities, right, with something we call transitional justice. Well, uh, eventually, the civil rights movement arises after the, the, the Second World War, and, and we have the NAACP uh, undertaking legal challenges to the, the uh, laws, uh, uh, the Jim Crow laws, and they end up succeeding, and, and finally bringing uh, some semblance of, of equal treatment under the law to, to America. But you also mentioned that, in some ways, the prior economic prosperity that blacks had experienced were a big was a big driver of the civil rights movement. Yeah. So I think um, a lot of times students come into class and they think, you know, there were, the civil rights movement began with Rosa Parks. I'm not don't want to diminish Rosa Parks or, or Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or anyone else who participated in the activism of the 1950s and the 1960s. But the reality is, is that there is a there was a huge huge effort of entrepreneurs. Uh, of businessmen and women, of lawyers, like you just mentioned, the NAACP, um, and, and of fraternal societies, black fraternal societies, who had come together to create this foundation upon which the civil rights movement had to draw. Mm -hmm. I always like to use sort of a couple of examples. In 1905, there was uh, sort of a boycott. From 1896 to 1905, there was a series of boycotts uh, of the trolleys to try and desegregate mm -hmm. them. And they ultimately failed. And I always ask my students, why, why did they fail in 1905, but they succeeded in 1955? Well, it's because of the base that was built from 1905 to 1955, which largely took place through the marketplace. And, and uh, furthermore, obviously, the, it took money to mount legal challenges. That's and, right. and, and, uh, uh, you know, that that was a, a big part of what we had uh, available later on, as, as opposed to in, in 1895 or so. so. Yeah, 
Well, this has been very fascinating. Any uh, thing to sort of like wrap up here before, because we've come to just about to the end of our time. Yeah. So. Black liberation through the marketplace offers Americans, if you want to call it that, a third way, okay? Um, you know, conservatives oftentimes, I think, overlook sort of injustice in the past, and I think sometimes the 1619 Project and those on the left sometimes sort of think that we need to get rid of liberalism in order to move forward. And what Rachel and I offer is a vision that says, hey, we can address past injustices without jettisoning our liberal values. Well, thanks so much for coming on Talk About Us, and, and thank you all for joining us. Join us again next time for another eConversations. This has been eConversations, a joint production of Troy Trojan Vision and the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. 